Hi there, it's Pastor Reese, and we thank you so much for watching today. We know this message is going to be a blessing in your life. Enjoy. Before I, I uh, go any further, you know, I, I really felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to encourage people who are online this morning. And you're part of our online campus, uh, and it's, it's always been a, a vision. It's interesting. It's always been a vision of our church to have an online campus, be able to reach out and do things. We just didn't quite think we'd get to it this quickly. Uh, it, it was kind of interesting that sometimes that, that uh, what the enemy intended to be evil, God has been able to use for good. And so we're continuing. Hey, that's, that's an amen moment. And we continue to want to dedicate resources and things. And so if you're watching online, one of the things I'd like to ask you to do is yeah, send us an email at, ec, at ecdenver.org with any uh, things you'd like to see us do to help enhance the online experience, how you could uh, make connections. It's so important that we not only have an encounter, but that we actually become part of a community uh, as we get involved in church. And we want to help grow the community aspect of our online church. And so if you've got some ideas, go ahead and just email those to us. We really appreciate that. And just know that you're loved, you're appreciated, and uh, we are so excited for what God is doing in this season. Uh, we, are, we, we are not a church, just so you know, if this is your first time to be here or to watch us and join us online, we're not a church that's sitting around going, God has abandoned us. Let us put Ichabod above the, you know, the, the, the entranceway. That's your assignment for the week. Look up what Ichabod means. You know? and, and, and so it's, it's a moment that we just, we don't want to do that. We believe that God is doing great things. Now, we are not in some sort of Pollyanna state of denial. We, we recognize that 2020 has seemed like the year in which we all got blindsided by a bus that came out of nowhere. Amen? Yeah. Wasn't looking for this. I was walking down the road, minding my own business, and this bus came out of nowhere and blasted me just all over the sidewalk. And then for good measure, it backed up and ran over me a couple of times again. I mean, you know, it's, it's a year that many people are calling the year that was wrecked. You know, this is the year when my wedding plans got wrecked. I had this idea we're going to get married and it was going to be in the mountains and there was going to be hundreds of people and I had my dress picked out and it was going to be so amazing. And instead, there were six of us in a hotel room and that was it and we got married there or whatever. There are people saying it wrecked my vacation. It wrecked my commencement. It wrecked my sports finals. It wrecked my business. It, it, it's, it's how People are framing the context for 2020. And I want you to know this morning that I really feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to encourage you that that is not how he wants 2020 to be remembered. He does not want us to remember this year that way. Instead, I believe this to the core of my soul, that 2020 can be one of the richest years of revelation for Christians in the church that occurs in our lifetime. There are things about God, about who we are in Christ, about our authority and power as believers. Uh, there are things that God wants to bring out that this literally could be a watershed moment that changes the course of our lives and makes every single year in the future better, hear me, better than they were in the past. How do I know that? One, I feel like that's consistent with the word of God and the character of our Lord. And two, I've seen this happen in my own lifetime. Something you may not know about me as a pastor, I have had 10 automobile accidents in my lifetime. Yeah, I had seven before I was 25. I can't borrow your truck. I don't blame you. I, I think that's, that's probably understandable. Uh, they were not all my fault, just to, to, to be clear. But, but I can tell you this. After 10 automobile accidents, I have learned this. Accidents are always educational. Always. Accidents are always educational. Every one of those 10 accidents, and some were my fault, most were not, thank you very much, okay, that no matter what happened, every one of those accidents caused me to walk in a fresh revelation of who God was, what my relationship with him meant to me, and it exposed things in me that I was able to address with the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and walk in greater victory. And so because of that, I want to focus 
on, on how it is we turn 2020 from being remembered as the year that was wrecked to being remembered as the year that changed my life. And it begins with learning to sit at the feet of Jesus. If you would open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew or, or find it on your cell phone or whatever, go to the 11th chapter and the 25th through the 30th verses. I just want to go over this passage briefly. And Jesus has done something. He's collected a group of people who are following him. They're coming around him. They're wanting to know more about him. And Jesus collects them. And this is what he says. At that time, Jesus prayed this prayer. O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these truths from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. I want to pause right there. During this time, there's a whole lot of people who do not want to learn anything because they would rather be mad. They would rather be angry. They'd be rather be frustrated. They'd rather shut down. You know, I, this, this, this couple of weeks ago, I was in line at the grocery store, and it was kind of crowded. You, you know when you're in the grocery, some of them you have to kind of queue up for like, you know, 300 feet until a, 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 a checker opens up. And there was a guy there in line with me. And I'll, I'll talk, I'm very talkative in case you hadn't figured that out. I'll talk to a stump if there's not a person to talk to. That's, that's, that's how desperately I like to communicate. But I was talking to this guy, and I said, hey, how you doing? And he turned around and he goes, isn't this stupid? Isn't this crazy? And he proceeds to go off. And, and you know, and he proceeds to, you know, give me his opinion on every single thing that is happening in the world today, you know, unsolicited by me. And, and it's okay. I'm willing to listen to it. But some of what he believes is based on an error. There, it's based on things that, isn't, that are not true. And I, being an insufferable know-it-all at some times, <laughs> you know, I proceeded to think, well, I will just clarify his belief system by uh, pointing out to him and what he doesn't, <laughs> where he's wrong, essentially. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit prompted me and said, you need to be quiet. And a miracle occurred. <laughs> I actually shut up because the Holy Spirit said he is a zealot. He is not interested in having his delusions pointed out. He is not interested in you telling him where he's wrong. He just wants to be angry. So let him. So I just sit nodded in my head and quietly prayed that a checker would open quickly so I could be delivered from this, this verbal assault. And, and the point of that story is this. The Holy Spirit does not want you to be that guy. Don't be that guy. Don't be the one who closes yourself off to, to, to the voice of God. Be the one who's willing to sit at the feet of Jesus and say, God, what is it you want to teach me in this season? Jesus continued in this passage. He says, my father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the son except the father. And no one truly knows the father except the son. And those to whom the son chooses to reveal him. And Jesus said, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And the yoke there is his teaching. Let me teach you. You should stop, underline that, highlight it, because that is the title of this message. Let him teach you. Because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I appreciate that these are difficult times. I just prayed with somebody even before service who's going through a very challenging time in their business. There, there's, there's mental health issues. There's all these other things there. We're under burdens. We're under heaviness. But if we are willing to set aside what angers us, what frustrates us, and sit at the feet of Jesus... And say, teach me, Lord, how I can turn this from the year that was wrecked into the year that changed my future and brought blessings into my life. And I walked in a fresh revelation of your love and your grace. Help me learn those things. Jesus, teach me. If we will do that, you will find the accident of 2020 and all of the other accidents of 2020, all of the accidents of 2020, very, very educational. And to illustrate this point, I felt like God wanted me to go back into my history and share with you a few things that I learned from all of the accidents that I found as a, that I had as a young man. Now, the pastors in pre-service you know, prayer, when I was sharing with them what I was going to talk on, they said, Pastor, are you really going to talk about 
all 10 accidents? Are you going to talk for an hour? Are you going to do that? And I want you to know that I do whatever the Holy Spirit tells me. And he said, don't do that. <laughs> so, so I'm only going to talk about four accidents that I had as a young man. And the first is the very first accident I ever had. My parents had an old car that they let the teenagers in the house. We had four of us uh, in, uh, who were teenagers. And uh, we affectionately called it Old Snort. It was a 1972 Chrysler Newport with 135,000 miles on it. And it was the most cold-blooded beast ever created by Detroit Auto Works. It, it was terrible. In the winter, you had to actually turn it on and let that thing warm up for 10 minutes. Otherwise, it would die getting out of the driveway. I mean, it literally was, it was a horrible car. And yet, it was our car. And so we drove it. And I was out with my buddies. We'd gone to a movie, gone out to eat afterwards. And it was a Friday night. And I was cruising around Joplin, Missouri, looking for something something to do that was going to get me into trouble. And I was just going down Range Line Road until I got to 15th Street. And at the corner of Range Line and 15th, there's a car in front of me. It's a green light. He goes through it. I am following him. I enter the intersection. There's a man in the left-hand turn lane who turns left into me. He guns his car, mind you. It's a big old Cadillac Coupe de Ville. He guns his car, smacks into the side of my Newport, and jams me over up against a telephone pole. Total the car. Car was ruined. My sisters may never have forgiven me. I, I, I don't know. But the point of that was I'm sitting there, have done nothing wrong. I'm just looking to do something wrong. But I haven't done anything wrong. And that car is completely wrecked. And years later, I was praying about this for some odd reason. It was during my quiet time. And God said, do you remember that wreck that you had when you were 16 years old? Yeah. The lesson that I want you to learn from that is this. You do not have to be doing something stupid in order to get impacted. All you have to be is in the vicinity of other people who are doing things that are stupid. And I said, well, how do I avoid people? Because, frankly, everybody is stupid. He's, <laughs> come on. At times, we are all stupid, all right? So what I do impacts you. What you do impacts me. How do I avoid that? He said, the key is you need to learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit because I will help guide you out of trouble and help keep you on the safe path. And the reason this is pertinent is because this happened when I was being asked to pray for a friend of mine at church back in the old building. And what had occurred is he had, he had got a new job, and it was the best job he'd ever had. It was the best job money-wise. He had a lot of authority, a lot of position, and, and he was really prospering. And he's in this position, and he comes to me and he says, Pastor, would you pray that I have wisdom? And I said, why? And he said, because in my spirit, something's off. There's something hinky about this company. I, I mean, they're not asking me to do anything illegal. They're not asking me to do anything immoral. But my gut says that there is something, you know, rotten in Denmark. And so, you know, we prayed that the Holy Spirit would leave him. And unfortunately, you know, he didn't respond to that. I mean, God eventually bailed him out and it all worked out. But the point of it was that that company's boss was conducting illegal transactions. And there was a statewide investigation that came in and eventually shut down the business. And the whole business went into bankruptcy. And God had given him a warning that he wanted him to get out of there before the whole thing fell apart. And that's what I want to tell you. The Holy Spirit can speak to you in the midst of difficult times and tell you this is where you need to stay and this is where you need to go. And it all flows from being willing not to just be angry, but to listen to the voice of God. Now that wreck wasn't my fault. Would you like to hear about a wreck that was my fault? Sure, sure you would. Yeah, of course you would. A couple of years later, I graduated high school. I had always worked. I had money. I had enough money for my first year of college. And I had $1,200 that I had saved as the down payment on a car. And like every young man at that particular generation, I went out looking for the car that I wanted. And I found a brand new car. It was red, had custom honeycomb wheels. It had a racing stripe down the nose. It had a killer stereo. It had a sunroof. It had fins. It had, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. 
And I, you know, and I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I got the down payment. I make enough money to make the payments on the car, but would you co-sign the loan for me? And my dad said, well, this is part of your life. You're a responsible young man, sort of. I'll co-sign the loan with you. So he does. So I got this car and I'm driving it around and I'm looking good and I'm thinking everybody thinks I'm cool because I know I think I'm cool. And I'm driving this and I went out partying with a bunch of friends of mine. Partied all day, all night, tried to drive home, passed out at the wheel, ran into a bluff, rolled it end over end, uh, woke up in a ditch along Interstate 44, covered in blood, my own. That's a very scary feeling. Uh, but I've told this story before, but I ended up you know, having to walk, miraculously got out of that. It was a good thing. What wasn't a good thing is when the insurance company paid off the car, there was no money left after the loan was cleared. So all of the money I'd put into it, stereo upgrades and everything, it was boop, it was gone, and no one to blame but myself. And so I'm having to figure out how to get to college, so I'm borrowing my mother's station wagon. You look really cool driving a station wagon at 18. It's, it's, it's quite a chick magnet. And so, <laughs> you know, so I'm driving the station wagon. I'm bumming rides from friends. I'm, I'm trying to get to work, trying to get to school, and everybody is telling my parents, you know something? That's the best thing that could happen to him. He needs to learn to be humble. He needs to learn to make better decisions. Just let the boy walk. Just let the boy not have a car. It is an excellent learning experience. And it was. But after two or three months, my father took a look at how hard that was on me, and it was actually very hard. And he comes to me and he says, Reese, here's the deal. Your mother and I have been talking. And we're willing to co-sign a loan with you for another car with this caveat we get to pick the car. And I want you to know I was desperate enough. That sounded like the best deal I'd heard in ages. And so we went in and we got another car. And what they picked me was, a, a, was an Econo Box uh, reliable vehicle. <laughs> that was definitely not a red sports car with a racing stripe and mag tires and honeycomb wheels. And years later, as I was asking God, because I wasn't a Christian at the time, I said, God, you know, what does that mean to me? And God said, this is it. Just like your father showed you grace when you really didn't deserve it, I will always show you grace, even when you don't deserve it. But just as your father's grace came with some conditions, I want you to know that my grace will often give you what you need, but it won't give you what you think you need. And it was a really powerful lesson that I realized that I could always go to my Heavenly Father and I could always find mercy and I could always find provision. But sometimes I had to plant my ego and my ambition and my testosterone and I had to put those things on, on hold to accept what I needed for the moment. And that was an incredibly important lesson for a young man to learn. It was an incredibly important lesson, and it would never have happened if I had not let the Holy Spirit take what had been a very tragic situation and use it to teach me about the love and the grace of God. The third wreck that I would like to share with you about, and this is my personal favorite. I had graduated college. I was still driving the, the, the Econo box. I was saving some money until I learned to spend it unwisely later in my young life. But I had some cash in my pocket. I'd been working about six months. And, and I was driving from Kansas City to Columbia, Missouri to attend a football game at the University of Missouri because I'm a Mizzou fan. Okay, I'm from Missouri. So I was going there to meet some old college buddies and we were just going to have a kind of little reunion weekend. I am a Christian, although I'm not exactly walking with Christ. And I'm on I-70 coming into Columbia on a football day. It's kind of crowded. They had construction going. They, they took the interstate, and they closed one of the lanes. So it's down to one lane. And so just like here, you're, you're just bumper to bumper, kind of stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And I'm minding my own business, just kind of taking you know, care of me. And suddenly I get a wham, and I get hit in the back. And I look behind me, and not only hit in the back, I get shoved into the car in front of me, which gets shoved into the car in front of me. It's a four-car pileup. We all have to pull off the side of the road. But the guy who instigated it is, is a guy in the back driving an 1837 Ford F-150. This is, this is an old pickup. That was a joke that just didn't go over there. Anyway, it was this ancient blue rust bucket. 
And so we all pull over and we all get out. Nobody's hurt. And this fella gets out of the truck. Now, this is down home talk, so I'm going to talk down home talk. He gets out and he goes, I'm sorry, everybody. I'm sorry, everybody. I really am sorry, everybody. I sure didn't mean to do that, but I, 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 I was sneezing and blowing my nose and I didn't see that fella there stop in time. Now, I want you to know that I'm going to do right by all y'all. I remember this just as clear as day. I'm going to do right by all y'all. I'm not going to leave y'all hanging. I'm going to pay all you guys. I do that. But we got a little challenge right now. Now, you need to know I ain't got no insurance. <laughs> and I ain't got no job. <laughs> you see, I'm a, I'm a Mississippi riverboat captain, and I've been unemployed for three months because they just ain't hauling stuff up and down the river like they used to. And I am sitting there on the side of the road going, Lord... How probable is it to get struck in the back by an ancient F-150 piloted by an unemployed Mississippi riverboat captain who was blowing his nose and sneezing at the time that he hit me? And I just chucked it up to, you know, whatever, God, just, you know, you know I paid my deductible and didn't really think about it. Candidly, I never thought about that, that Mississippi riverboat captain at, again, except when I was telling humorous stories. I had no animosity in my heart. Figured he was, I, seriously, I figured he had bigger problems than me. And <laughs> there was no reason for me to, to be angry or in unforgiveness towards him, even though he'd messed up my, my car. And, and this became important several years later. Because as you all know, I ran up a lot of credit card debt early in my, my adulthood. I ended up owning $17,000, and I was really struggling because I had all this credit card debt to make ends meet. And, and I was just, you know, it was month to month, and I was looking to try to figure it out. And there was one month I was really short, and I went out to my mailbox, and in that mailbox was a letter from State Farm Insurance. Now, typically, I don't like to open those because those are bills. Uh, but this one looked different, so I opened it up, and inside was a check for $283. And I'm looking like, what the heck is State Farm sending me $283? Because it came in in a great moment, just so you know. And I called State Farm, and they said, well, this is the payout for the settlement with the man who hit your car four years earlier. Seriously, he made it right. He made it right. And this, I didn't get my full $500 back, but I got $283. And I was praising God, and God spoke to me at that moment. He said, do you know why this blessing came back into your life? And I said, yeah, because he was an honest man. He said, no. It's because you have chosen not to walk in unforgiveness towards him. You have not chosen to harbor bitterness in your heart towards him. Because when you harbor bitterness and unforgiveness, you literally choke the conduit of God's blessing into your life. But Reese, if you'll learn to walk in forgiveness... And, and, and be quick to walk away from things and not to be so focused on what people do to you, but trust in me to make it right, me to bring in the provision. You open up the conduit and you allow the blessings of God to come and rest in your life. That's a pretty good lesson for 500 bucks, don't you think? I think it was a very good lesson. Well worth the price of being in a car wreck. Last story I want to share this morning is the story of what happened after I got rid of the Econo box that I drove in college, and I had finally bought my first car as an adult engineer. And I hadn't learned my lesson from the first car, so I went out and bought a turbocharged five-speed, you know... <laughs> It was black, had a yellow racing strike, had mag wheels, five on the floor. No, it had a beautiful sound to it, okay. And so I had bought this car that I really couldn't afford, which is part of the reason why I was having financial problems. But I, was, I had got right with God. I had recommitted my heart to Christ. I had decided God needed to lead me to a congregation because I knew that, you know, what had happened is I got into some old stuff that I had gotten out of and I had to repent. And I knew God told me that if you do not get into a community, you will just do this over and over and over again. Because it's in community that we hold each other accountable. It's in community that we receive the strength to be able to make true transformation. It's in community where I can draw from you and you can draw from me. It's an incredibly important thing in anybody's spiritual growth. And I had committed to a church. And not only committed to a church, I had committed to lead the morning intercessory prayer at 6 o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday. And the pastor had given me, a 23-year-old guy, the keys to the church. 
And I literally moved my apartment to four blocks from the church so I could go over every morning at 6 o'clock and open the door and go in and pray. Now, some mornings it was just me. Some mornings it was me and Gary Mitchell. Some mornings it was me, Gary Mitchell, and four or five other people. But we did this for years where we would go in from 6 to 7 and pray. Well, there was one morning where it was cold. It was winter in Kansas City, and a fog bank had descended. So I got out of my apartment, walked to my car, boom, I turned it on, popped open my lights, backed up. I'd leave because there was a little hilly section. And there was like four or five different apartment buildings around there, all little small independently owned ones. And there was two across the street that were really close together and their driveway was between them. And the driveway sloped downhill. And so I make my left and I proceed, you know, going to the church, and out of that little driveway, this car zips out at 6 a.m. and plows into the side, T-boning my car. Car never worked the same again. It totally ruined the car. Not, not her fault, but this nice young lady gets out, and she's, all, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. I didn't see you. I feel so bad. And I said, look, this is great. Look, I got some place to be. Can we just exchange insurances, and you know, I, we'll contact each other, and that's all great. And we did. And her insurance paid to sort of fix my car. But, but the point of the story is the very next day, she comes over and, and there was a knock on my apartment door. And I open the door and she's standing there. And it's evening and, and she said, look, I felt so bad about hitting your car yesterday that, that I felt like I wanted to do something to make it up. So I've brought you this bottle of wine. Now, here's the deal. The church where I got saved and spirit-filled at was a country Pentecostal church in Rolla, Missouri that was religious, judgmental, and narrow-minded. They didn't believe in women preachers. They didn't believe, certainly, in alcohol. Their youth group used to have celebration bonfires where you burned the devil's music, if you understand what I'm saying. And they'd go, oh, look at that. We're tossing albums in there and just take it for the glory of God. There wasn't much tolerance... Seriously, I've come a long way, all right? <laughs> now, that was where I got saved and spirit-filled. The church the Holy Spirit led me to in Kansas City was led by a couple, including a woman preacher. And they were much more open to being inclusive and welcoming. And I was having to unlearn a lot of stuff, but I still had that residual stuff. And there, when you have backslidden and you're trying to get right with God, I want no taint of the enemy to stain me. And I looked at this woman at my door and I said, you know, that is so nice of you. I thank you. But you see, I am a Christian and I don't drink. And so I cannot receive that alcohol into my house. <laughs> and you could just see her face fall. You could see that that hurt her. And she said, well, thank you, because she was just trying to do a nice act to me. And I closed the door, and she went on her way. And I felt bad. And so I go the next day to church, or shortly thereafter, and I, I, I see my pastor, David Ferguson. I said, David, can I talk to you about something that happened? And I explained the situation, and I said, I feel like I did the wrong thing. And he looks at me and says, that's because you did. <laughs> And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, Reese, you should have taken it. She was offering it in peace. She was offering it a, 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 as an act of contrition. You know, you could have received it. You don't have to drink it. Pour it down the sink if you want to. You know, use it in cooking or give it away, whatever. But what was important to you at that moment was that God was giving you an opportunity to minister to her. You could have invited her in. You could have talked to her. The church is four blocks away. You could have invited her to church. You could have invited her to the singles group that I was leading at the time. The Bible study that I helped teach on Sunday mornings. There was all kinds of opportunities for me to be able to, to minister to her. But my religiosity, my judgmental attitude shut that down. And so I repented. Which is important because of what happened a few months later. A few months later, I got a new neighbor. We were both on the first floor. We shared a wall in our apartment. It wasn't a very good wall. She would get mad at me if I played my worship music too loud. I would get mad at her because she had guests who stayed over at her place at night. It was annoying. And one day, I hear this sound coming from her apartment. She is screaming. She is cussing. Things are breaking. Now, where I was raised, you don't ignore those things. You go up and see if somebody needs help. It's got... You know, I think it's a good way to live, just personally. So I get out of my apartment, I go over and start banging on her door. And she finally opens the door and she is crying, she's upset, her hair is askew, there's stuff thrown around her apartment. 
And I said, are you okay? And she says, I'm fine, which clearly isn't right. I said, look, what's going on? I, I, can I help you in some way? And she says, no, you wouldn't understand. And I said, what do you mean I wouldn't understand? I'd understand. I mean, and she said, you wouldn't understand. I said, well, well I don't know, try me. Well, what's going on? And she says, do you understand lesbians? Do you understand being gay? Now, this is way bigger than a bottle of wine, just, so, just for the record. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit reminded me of that lesson. And he gave me a word to speak. And I said, you know, you're right. I don't know what it means to be gay. And I don't understand lesbians. But I understand people. And you look like you're hurting. And so she invites me in. And we had a long conversation. What occurred is her, her girlfriend left her for her, the girlfriend's boyfriend. The girlfriend was bisexual. And her comment was, she said, Reese, here's the deal. This is the third girl who's dropped me. And all I want in my life is to find somebody who will love me and accept me and stay with me. And I thought, well, who couldn't understand that? Who couldn't understand that? So I talked to her about the love of God, and I talked to her about the love of Jesus. And she wasn't interested in receiving God, and she wasn't interested in receiving Jesus, but she let me pray for her, that God would comfort her, and that God would bring peace into her heart. And I invited her to my Bible study, and she came, came at least two or three times. She came to some, some uh, outreaches we did, not outreaches, but, you know, like barbecues and cookouts. And she moved about six months later, but during that six months, I had multiple opportunities to minister to her, and other people in my group had opportunities to minister to her, because I did not forget the lesson that religion and judgmental attitudes pushes people away, but grace and mercy and acceptance opens doors for us to begin to talk to people about the pain of their hearts and what God can do to meet the pain, because the world will always have a counterfeit. The world will always have a lie. The world will always offer people solutions that aren't solutions. They're just bondages. And yet God has given us the, God has given us the gospel of reconciliation that tells people that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And what an incredible lesson to learn from getting T-boned from a lady on a foggy morning at 6 a.m. in Kansas City, Missouri. My point in sharing all of those is simply this. The decision of how we will remember 2020 is up to us. Will we settle in our hurts and settle in our pains and settle in our, our annoyances and frustrations with all the stuff that's going on? Will we be the angry person in the grocery store checkout line or will we be the people who are willing to say, Father, there's a lesson for us to learn here. And these accidents, these can be educational. And we can grow in our knowledge of you and your love. Lord, teach us. And that's who I believe God wants us to be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that all of us have been frustrated over these last few months. And, and we'll be frustrated again. I don't have any delusion, Father, that we're all going to walk away from here and be perfect. But Father, I, I, I just, I want to remember this message myself. I want to remember that, Father, I don't have to define 2020 as the year that was lost. I can define 2020 in a different way with your help, and we can define it as the year in which you changed our futures because of what we learned in the midst of our pain. And so I ask God for peace to come upon the hearts of everybody who is either watching right now or, or in this room live, that we would allow you, Father, to, to teach us what it means to put your yoke upon us and to take your burden upon us so we can cast away all the pain and the, and, the, and the hurt and walk in the love and the grace of God. Father, as I pray, I just want to also pray for people where you would... You just admit that either, well, you would just admit that your relationship with God just isn't right. Maybe you've never had a relationship with God. And by relationship, I mean that you would say that God knows you. You've had conversations with him about your heart and your ambitions and your hurts and your struggles. That, that, that you would have had him speak to you 
either you know, through a person or through the word of God of, of, of what it is to, to, to walk in revelation knowledge. You don't really have that relationship. But I want to encourage you that this morning or this evening, whenever you're seeing this message, that you can have that relationship. You can have, you can have God talk to you. And you can share all the stuff that's going on with him and, and learn from it. All it takes is you being willing to invite him into your life in a fresh way. And so if you'd like to do that, I just encourage you to pray that right now. Say, Jesus, I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. I invite you to be my Lord and my Savior. Come into my life in a fresh new way so that I can walk in victory. I believe in Jesus. And I want to be your child. Amen. That's my message. I want you to know also that I've become a much safer driver, so you do not have to be afraid as you leave the parking lot today. Uh, I, I love each and every one of you. I love you online. I love connecting with you, uh, whether by email, by text, by, by phone calls, uh, person to person here at our services. And uh, it's great to be a part of the kingdom of God. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. Uh, please tune in and watch us online on Wednesday night uh, and be here live next Sunday. And pray for Sarah and I. We're going up to the mountains Thursday and Friday for a little getaway, so it uh, should be fun. Go with God. Well, thank you for watching today. We pray that this message was a blessing to you and your family. Yeah, we invite you to watch us again on Facebook or on YouTube. And if you haven't yet liked our Facebook page or are subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, please do so now. God bless you and your family. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.